Good to be with you once again for our final session on the historicity of the resurrection. As always, let's uh, join together for uh, to get things going with morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. As always, I invite any feedback that you might have, questions, comments, and otherwise. You can send that to pastor at villagelutheranchurch.org. So we have arrived at this point that we have really established that the gospel accounts are historically reliable. And that leads to the question of, so what? So what if they are historically reliable? Well, let's not put the if in there because it's not an if. They are historically reliable. You'll recall that we have established this uh, rather clearly, uh, that 75% of scholars, and that includes those who are not sympathetic to the biblical accounts, find that the empty tomb is a historic event that has to be grappled with in one way or another. We've even addressed some of the competing theories about uh, that people have set forth to try to overcome the empty tomb, accepting that there actually is a, an empty tomb, but then uh, what must be done in order to overcome that. But when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus being a historical event, how do we respond to that? Well, one way that we ought to do that is by using what is known as Occam's razor. I'm sure many of you have heard of that before. It was uh, coined by William of Occam, hence Occam's razor, where it's uh, kind of condensed to say, all things being equal, the simplest solution tends to be the best one. So rather than invent a bunch of things to try to get away from the natural result of the evidence that's before you, just go with the simplest solution that there is. Now, I would encourage us to think about this is how we approach the historical evidence that is set before us. The empty tomb is recognized to be a historical reality. So how do you grapple with that? You can invent all kinds of different things for which you have absolutely no evidence. Things like uh, his body was stolen away, he never really died, or that it was a big conspiracy along the way, and any number of other things. Or the simplest solution is that the accounts are actually accurate, that you don't explain away the historical evidence that there is by other things that you don't actually have any evidence for. Instead, you go with the historical evidence you have. And that is and includes the four accounts of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as historically reliable accounts. So accept the accounts according to Occam's razor would be the best way to go. You accept the accounts that we have before us. So if you do that, here comes the so what. When someone rises from the dead, you probably should listen to them. This is the real reason to listen to Jesus. He rose from the dead. Now, um, I will admit, and I've said this already before in this entire series, I cannot argue anyone into the Christian faith to try to get you to believe in Christ simply because I have set forth all these arguments about why the philosophical objections, the historical objections, why all of them actually fade away in the face of the actual evidence, and therefore this is a historic reality that you have to grapple with. I That will not argue you into the faith. What it can do is remove obstacles so that the ground of faith, that is these historical events, the historical people, and historical places, may be all the more apparent. But that's not what's going to actually um, bring somebody into the Christian faith. What brings you into the faith is the message of what Christ has done for you. Another way that you can approach it is this, that this is similar to what happened to the Apostle Paul 
on the road to Damascus. Now, at that point in time, he was known as Saul, and he would be known as Saul uh, after this account, uh, even for a period of time, until he really became the apostle to the Gentiles. And then he drops, uh, well, doesn't really drop, but he doesn't use his Jewish name Saul as prominently as what he takes on a Greek name, Paul, so that he might uh, better relate to those Greek individuals, the Gentiles. But you'll remember on the road to Damascus, Paul is confronted with the resurrected Christ. Paul was certain that Jesus was a charlatan up until that point, and he was therefore a fierce opponent of the Christian faith. He uh, was actually on his way to Damascus in order to persecute the church that was found in Damascus. But when Jesus comes along and knocks him to the ground, blinds him, and reveals himself to Paul, this changed everything for Paul. He ends up going to Damascus, and there he ends up being baptized by uh, one of the faithful who is present there and is sent by God for that very purpose to baptize Paul. Then uh, we are told that after that, Paul ended, off, ended up going off into the desert off by himself, really, for three years. And I would uh, expect that what he was spending those three years doing was rethinking everything, because the resurrection of Christ changes everything. If this guy rose from the dead, now everything that I have known before is wrong. I've got to change everything to grapple with this reality. Now, that's what St. Paul had to do. It's also what we are called to do. The resurrection of Christ changes everything. And what it, what it changes things by is the message that Christ delivers. What is it that Jesus claims to be true? And this is what brings somebody into the faith. It's not all the arguments we've had over these past sessions. What brings them into the faith, and I pray that some are listening who it will do this for them as well, is the specific claims, the message that Jesus delivers. What does this resurrected man say? Well, before he died and rose, here's what he said. First of all, he claimed to be God. Now, there you'll uh, perhaps recognize the face of God as it was painted by Michelangelo in uh, his famous piece, The Creation of Adam. Jesus claimed to be God. Now, there are some who will say that Jesus never overtly claimed to be God. It is actually rather clear that he did. Um, there are various places where he says things such as this. I and the Father are one. A clear claim to divinity. Elsewhere, he says, before Abraham was. Now, by the way, at the time of Christ, Abraham had been dead in the grave for roughly 2,000 years. So before Abraham was, I am so not only does Jesus claim to exist prior to Abraham, but he puts himself in the present tense, I am, as a way to identify himself with God who revealed himself to Moses saying, I am who I am. You can also recognize that everyone else thought that Jesus was claiming to be God because what did they always want to do? They wanted to stone him because of what he was saying. They said, he's guilty of blasphemy. We need to stone this man. He claims to be God. Furthermore, when he is brought up on charges on uh, the night uh, he's betrayed and then into the next day, the charges are largely those of blasphemy. Now they have to tweak those charges when they bring him before the Roman authorities because they're not really too concerned about whether he claims to be uh, the Jewish God or not. But it is clear that the number one concern is that he has is blasphemous. He claims to be God, and Jesus never objects to that. Now, otherwise, here's other ways in which you can see that Jesus claimed to be God. One example would be the healing of the paralytic. You'll remember this account. Jesus is in a house, and he's teaching, and uh, these men bring their friend who's a uh, paralyzed, and they want Jesus to heal him, but they can't get in because the place is so crowded. So they climb up on the roof, they open up a hole in the roof, and they lower him down. And the first thing that Jesus does is he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, this gets many people upset, uh, the Pharisees and such, because they say, how can this guy say that uh, another man's sin is forgiven? Only God has the authority to forgive sin. 
and they're right. Only God has that authority, and this is exactly what Jesus is claiming. Now, Jesus also recognizes that um, to say somebody is forgiven, there's no tangible evidence of that that you can immediately see, oh, they are forgiven. So he's going to back it up to show that he truly has this authority by doing something that will give tangible evidence. He says to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up and walk. And the man gets up and walks. So Jesus is clearly claiming divine authority to forgive sin, and then he backs it up with that miracle. Another way in which you can see that Jesus most certainly claimed to be God was that people would prostrate themselves to him, bow down to him. Now, uh, the specific piece of art that you see there, you can tell this is uh, baby Jesus, and you have the Magi who have come and they're giving him their gifts and notice they are bowing down before him. Even one is fully prostrate on the ground. Now, this is not the only time that you'd have individuals prostrating themselves to Jesus. And it is the standard within Holy Scripture that you only prostrate yourself before God himself. One of my favorite examples of this is in the book of Revelation, when John sees an angel, and this happens on a couple of occasions in Revelation, he sees him, and he, so majestic that his natural reaction is to prostrate himself. And the angel always says this, get up. Don't prostrate yourself before anyone except for God. Now, read through the gospel accounts, and you will find that Jesus, on numerous occasions, as an infant here, with the visit of the Magi, with the disciples when they meet him after he's risen from the dead, of the disciples also earlier in time when he would perform great acts, that he would be the, uh, the one to whom people would prostrate themselves. And guess what? He accepts that prostration. He never tells them that they are doing the wrong thing, because he knows he is God, and this is the proper posture before God. So first thing that Jesus claims very clearly, that he is God. Now, when a man claims to be God, and then he rises from the dead, you probably want to listen to him. More of Jesus's claims. He claims that you and I have a problem, and our problem is that we are dead. We are dead in our sins. This is not a very uh, fun teaching for us to hear because we like to think of ourselves as being as alive as possible. But instead, Jesus says, sin leaves you dead. Not alive, but dead. And the problem with being dead is you can't do anything about it. No dead person can make himself alive. Life can only be given to him by somebody else acting on his behalf. And this is why Jesus says he needs to be here, so that he can be the one that overcomes death. Furthermore, he says more about that death. Death is a result of us fleeing from God. That sin is about rebellion, and rebellion leads to death running from God, running straight toward our grave. Now, this should prompt a few questions within us. What is my chief problem? My chief problem is not that I don't have enough money. That can be a problem if you're not able to provide for your own needs and the needs of those who are under your care, but it's not your chief problem. My chief problem is not that... Um, I have a sense of a lack of fulfillment within my life. Now, that can be rather frustrating, and it's not something towards which we should be callous, but that's not my chief problem. My chief problem is not that I don't have my dreams realized and such. My chief problem is that I'm a sinner. I rebel against God and his word, and therefore I am subject to death as a result of it should also lead to this question. How big of a problem is that? It doesn't get any bigger of a problem because it's not just about physical death. It's about eternal death, which is about being subject to God's 
judgment of our sin. I'm reminded of one of the hymns that we often sing during Holy Week. Uh, it's entitled Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. So if you think that your sin is a small issue, listen to this. Ye who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great, here may view its nature rightly, here its guilt may estimate. Mark the sacrifice appointed. See who bears the awful load. Tis the word, the Lord's anointed, Son of Man and Son of God. To kind of condense that down a little bit, if you think sin is not a big deal, if you think our rebellion against God is not a big deal, see what it takes in order to save us from that. It takes the death of Christ. And not just his death, but his taking God's wrath upon himself at the cross. Nothing less than that can save us from the death we've earned for ourselves because of our rebellion against God. So here comes Jesus's big claims again. What does Jesus claim that he has done? That he is the one that who has undone our rebellion. Like the so-called prodigal son who had run away from his father's house and all of its goodness and then comes home. And what does the father do? The father does not say it's about time when I was wondering if you're ever going to come to your senses. No, all the father does out of pure joy is runs to embrace his son and then puts the best robe on him, puts his ring on him, throws a big party with a great feast and such. So this is what Jesus claims, that he has not come while he is going to let us know about our sin and that we have rebelled against God, that what he has come is to undo that. He would not have us remain dead. He would not have us remain in rebellion against God, but rather he would have us be embraced in God's arms of mercy and welcomed back home. Furthermore, he says this, there's only one way that the rebellion and death can be undone. There's only one way to end up in the Father's arms and be back home. And it can only be done by the cross of Christ. There is no other way. Jesus constantly says that he is the sole means of salvation. He brings peace for you and I through his cross. Now, first and foremost, that is peace between us and God. Vertical peace. And that is true even when I recognize the depth of my sin that I uh, may commit on a given day. I have sorrow over that sin, but I also have peace. And the peace is always greater than the sorrow because I know what Christ has won for me. He has earned for me the Father's favor. I can stand always before God with confidence, with my head held high, not bowed over under guilt and shame, because that's been all taken away by Christ. Instead, I stand before God with joyful confidence because of what Christ has done for me. More that Jesus claims for us. He claims that not only did he die in order to give us that peace, but also that he is going to rise from the dead. Now, this is Jesus's regular statement throughout those gospel accounts. He would, on multiple occasions, say, I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified, and then on the third day I will rise again in order to bring you everlasting life. So Jesus dies for us and rises again. We rejoice in the cross of Christ, but we rejoice even more that the cross does not get the last word. Christ rises from the dead. And furthermore, not only has he risen from the dead, he has ascended to the right hand of the Father. There you see Christ ascending. Members here at Village will recognize that piece. That is the uh, altar piece that we enjoy so much here at Village. Christ ascending, and you'll notice uh, with his hands and his feet still bearing those nail marks as proclamation of what he has won for us by his cross. But also what Jesus promises is this, that he ascends for a purpose. He ascends so that he might intercede for you and me. He speaks to the Father on our behalf. 
So it's not as if Jesus, on the 40th day when he ascended into heaven, went into a perpetual vacation. After all, he is God. He's not in need of a great rest, as if he is tuckered out. But instead, he ascends so that he might continue to serve you. And the way he serves you now includes that he intercedes on your behalf. He speaks to the Father. And this is, again, why you can have confidence in that peace that Christ has won for you. Because when your sin puts you at enmity with God so that you are rebelling against him, what does Jesus do? He speaks on your behalf. He says to the Father, yes, this one has rebelled against you. Yes, this one has sinned, but I died for this one. I rose for this one. Forgive this one. And the Father cannot deny his son's request. The Father looks with joy upon you because of what Christ has done for you. He died, he rose, and now he is ascended on high. But we're still not done. Jesus also promised that as he ascended, so also he will return. He ascended on the clouds. He will come again on the clouds. He will come again on the last day that he might take this fallen world and make it to be as it was created to be. Sin stripped away, the fall undone, and instead we have an eternity of God's perfect goodness. Now what this does is it highlights for us again what we've been saying all along. This is all about historical people, historical places, and historical events. Jesus is a historical person who engaged in various historical events from his miracles, but even more importantly, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension, which gives us joyful confidence in the coming historical event of his return again for us. With the confidence in those historical events, we live out our Christian faith. Now, what that leads us to is to the next question, and this is going to catapult us into our next Bible study series, and it's this. If Jesus has done all this historical stuff, what does that say about who we are physically? Because, after all, historical people, historical places, historical events are all really physical things. And this is where we're going to head beginning next week. We're going to be looking at the beauty of the physical. There you see the hand of God reaching out to touch the hand of Adam. Again, in Michelangelo's wonderful piece, The Creation of Adam. There you see the beauty of the physical. God created us physically. He redeems us physically. He, re he will come again for us physically. Beginning next week, I hope you'll be back with us because we're going to march through the beauty of the physical. And one of the ways that we'll be looking at this is how our world often tries to tell us the exact opposite. The world tries to downplay the physical and make it somehow less when actually the physical should be recognized as truly beautiful because it's been created by God. Even as it's in the physical that God goes about his historical work of our salvation. Historical crucifixion, historical resurrection, historical ascension, and, yet to come, a historical return of Christ. I pray that you'll be back with me again next time as we shift into the beauty of the physical. The Lord be with you.